Thank you, Jenny. And thank you all so much. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with you all. It is a tremendous honor, and I am very grateful. I love Zoom for the reason that it allows us to come together over distances. So geography no longer separates us. As we know, geography has never separated us spiritually. It has physically. As Jenny indicated, our topic today is forgiveness and spirituality. We know from our the theosophical studies that we're complex beings with both a personality that is limited to this one lifetime and a higher consciousness that transcends the personality and yet incorporates its lessons for our ongoing evolutionary journey. During this journey, we experience suffering frequently at the hands of others. Our personalities, especially the emotional and lower mental, those components of our human constitution can hold on to bitterness, to anger, to hurt, betrayal, and on and on. And it can also hold on to thoughts of revenge, or retaliation, somehow getting back at the person who hurt us. So the question for us is, how do we move past these aspects of the personality into a place of forgiveness? It is important for us to realize that the personality is an essential part of our journey. While it is a temporary abode for our souls, it is through the personality that we live and have experiences. These experiences allow us to expand our consciousness and our awareness. Sometimes, these experiences include interactions with others that are hurtful. We may feel slighted or betrayed, hurt. And sometimes that hurt seems to touch the deepest parts of us. Well, at least the deepest parts of our personality. When this happens, we can sometimes hold on to the feelings that come with that hurt. We may hold a grudge. We may cut people off who have hurt us. Sometimes we may even feel like we hate the other person. As seekers on the spiritual path, this seems a contradiction, but yet we may struggle with it. So does struggling with these feelings, with forgiving other people who have hurt us, does that make us less spiritual? I don't think so. Now, I am a seeker just like everyone else here. So these are my perspectives. But I think that they are rooted in the ageless wisdom. Struggling with forgiveness when we're hurt makes us human. It's the personality that's hurt. Our higher self, that higher aspect of ourselves, does not experience the hurt, but it does incorporate the growth that we experience when we're hurt. I'm sure most of you have heard it said from time to time that holding on to anger or resentment or bitterness or whatever other word you may choose to use is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. 
The idea of forgiving someone who has hurt us so deeply can feel abhorrent and not even remotely possible. However, remaining in this state is unhealthy. It's unhealthy physically, psychologically, and spiritually. So today we're going to talk about, briefly, about the physical and psychological aspects of forgiveness. But more importantly, we're going to explore the spiritual component of forgiveness. So before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about what forgiveness actually means. Like most words, it can mean different things to different people. So each of us may want to consider what forgiveness means to us individually. I'm going to share my screen and pull up the PowerPoint. All right. There we are. So. There we go. I always like to go back to the dictionary and, and find out what most people think forgiveness means. So if we look at a, a dictionary definition, and what we will find is that it means to cease to feel resentment against an offender, to give up resentment of or claim to requital for something, such as an insult. Okay. There's another way to look at it, I think. From my perspective, forgiveness does not mean acceptance, forgetting, or excusing the behavior that hurt us. So many times people will say, I can't forgive that person for what they did. Because the assumption is that forgiving means that we are accepting the behavior, we're forgetting about the behavior, or we're excusing it. But we're not doing any of those things. Forgiveness means letting go of the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, all of those feelings that impact us. That's what forgiveness is all about. Now, I do want to say that a little caveat at this point, we may need to set boundaries with the person who hurt us, perhaps maintaining a distance from them or even breaking off contact completely, if necessary. This, however, does not preclude forgiveness. Forgiveness and lack of con contact to keep from being hurt again are not the same thing. So, Let's deal with the easiest part first. Um, that's, that's the physical component. Holding on to anger impacts us physically. For instance, on the hopkinsmedicine.org website, we read this, that studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for our health, lowering risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels, improving sleep, reducing pain, reducing blood pressure, and reducing levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. And research indicates um, an increase in this forgiveness health connection as we age. So forgiveness makes a difference in our physical health which is very important. This is the vehicle that we are using to have experiences on our spiritual journey. Um, there are also psychological benefits to forgiveness. So Robert Enright in his article, The Eight Benefits, I'm sorry, The Eight Keys to Forgiveness, tells us that working on forgiveness and notice he says working on forgiveness because it's a process. 
Working on forgiveness can help us to increase our self-esteem and give us a sense of inner strength and safety. It can reverse the lies that we often tell ourselves when someone's hurt us so badly. Lies like, I'm defeated, I'm not worthy, not good enough. Forgiveness can heal us and allow us to move on in life with meaning and purpose. Forgiveness matters, and we will be its primary beneficiary. Studies have shown that forgiving others produces strong psychological benefits for the one who forgives. It has been shown to decrease depression, anxiety, unhealthy anger, and the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't think any of this comes as a surprise as a surprise to us, um, but it is something important to think about. If we examine the concept of forgiveness and its impact beyond just this current physical incarnation, beyond the physical and psychological impacts it may have on us, and we look at the spiritual impact, we obviously have to discuss karma. Da-da, karma, the big word. Now, you guys know as well as I do that before the introduction of the Theosophical Society in 1875, very few people in the Western part of the world ever heard the word karma. And it is likely that even fewer had an understanding of its meaning. However, in the past 145 plus years, much has changed. Most individuals living in the Western part of the world have heard the term, and many have some basic understanding of it. We find memes and cartoons regarding karma, including references to instant karma. We hear it referred to in a variety of different terms, the law of cause and effect law of action and reaction, universal law, the law of harmony, the law of self-created destiny, and on and on. We know that there have been numerous books, articles, and talks about karma that can be found in both the East and the West from spiritual perspectives as well as pragmatic ones from very shallow perspectives to an in-depth perspective. A great deal has been said about karma in these intervening years. However, not everyone is in agreement about it. So it's probably useful for us to do our own exploration of this very important concept. What I will share with you are a few mm, statements that are, oh, there, that worked. A few statements about karma, which many seekers on the path, with which many seekers on the path would agree. It is a universal principle that is inherent in the universe. It is impersonable, I'm sorry, impersonal, may be impersonable too, but definitely impersonal and inexorable. Every action has a reaction, and karma is inextricably linked to reincarnation. In all honesty, I am not sure that we have much more of an understanding of karma than those few points listed. We frequently speak as if we understand karma in depth, but do we? We are reminded of the words of the Mahatma K.H. to A.P. Senate in letter number 126 of the chronological version of uh, the Mahatma letters. When he writes, you know nothing of the ins and outs of the working work of karma. Have another look. I'm sorry. You know nothing of the ins and outs of the work of karma. 
And then later in the letter, he says, have another look at karma and remember that it ever works in the most unexpected ways. Along these same lines, Mabel Collins tells us in her essay on karma that the operations of karma cannot be fully understood until, quote, until the disciple has reached the point at which they no longer affect him or her. Thus, we recognize that it is not possible to grasp the entire concept of karma at this point in our spiritual evolution. However, if we contemplate this concept deeply, and I think we all spend a great deal of time contemplating these ageless wisdom concepts, if we spend some time in self-introspection, listening to that small voice within, we may have some small intuitive glimpse of the workings of karma. Even without a thorough understanding of karma, we can use those four statements that we discussed to help us in our daily lives. And I know it sounds like I'm moving away from forgiveness, but I promise I'm not. These assertions provide us with direction and understanding as we consider forgiveness. So the first one, the statement that karma is an inherent principle in the universe implies that there is order in the universe. It implies that there is some sort of cosmic intelligence that has created a structure and that incidents which occur are not random, chaotic, or happenstance. As human beings, when we are hurt deeply, it feels like the world is out of control, that nothing makes sense. We can be thrust into chaos so quickly. So the memory or the recognition that there is order in the universe, that it's not random or chaotic, can kind of help us from swinging on this pendulum a bit. Karma is a principle or a law similar to the way we think about gravity. Gravity is neither good nor bad. It just is. If we fall, we don't think, ah, oh, this must be because of bad gravity. Of course not. Just like when something bad happens, hopefully we're not thinking, this is bad karma. Karma just is. It simply is. Taking these steps, these statements a step further, Excuse me, we can look at the second assertion. Karma is impersonal and inexorable. This sounds somewhat ominous, but gravity is also impersonal and inexorable, and we don't typically perceive it as ominous. Gravity doesn't decide, I'm going to make that person fall, but not that person. Gravity always works the same way, without fail, as does karma. In light of the third assertion, for every action, there is a reaction. We can reflect upon the words of H.P. Blavatsky in Key to Theosophy. She writes, and this is a quote, even though I didn't put it in quotation marks on the slide. Karma is the unerring law which adjusts effect to cause on the physical, mental, and spiritual planes of being. As no cause remains without its due effect, from greatest to least, from cosmic disturbance down to the movement of your hand, 
And as like produces like, karma is that unseen and unknown law which adjusts wisely, intelligently, and equitably each effect to its cause, tracing the latter back to its producer. HPB tells us that karma is the law of universal harmony. She uses the metaphor of a tree to describe it, saying that when the limb of a tree is bent forcibly, it rebounds accordingly. As theosophists, we know that our every thought, word, and action causes a wave of energy, a vibration, each of which has a, rebound, a rebounding effect on us. This is the way in which the universe maintains equilibrium, according to H.P. Blavatsky. For every cause, there will be an effect. And the fourth assertion, karma is inextricably linked to reincarnation. As students of theosophy, we are well aware of this. Um, it does take us into a little bit different arena than the other three statements that we were discussing. Theosophical literature tells us um, about the spiritual evolution of the soul. It tells us that through a series of incarnations, we continue to learn and grow spiritually until that point in time when we become totally human, when we perfected all aspects of this human. As John Algio, former president of the Theosophical Society in America writes, the purpose of our many lives is to further the evolutionary development of our minds and souls. We are expanding our consciousness as we live each life, with the goal being to further this evolutionary development, to become fully human, and in doing so, recognize the unity of all beings. One of the ways in which we expand our consciousness involves a variety of human experiences many of which I think um, entail a degree of pain or a disruption in some way or other. We can interpret these experiences karmically. Not only does karma restore balance and equilibrium, but in doing so, it provides us with the opportunity for growth, for expanding our consciousness. Looking back on our lives, we may ask ourselves, when have I grown the most? When have I learned the most? For many of us, the answer tends to be living through a very difficult time. Frequently a time of loss, a time of tragedy, a time of hurt. Blavatsky put this concept in a different way. In her pamphlet, Reincarnation and Karma, Part 1, which I found on the Theosophy World website, she talks about this growth saying, the inner being must continually burst through its confining shell or encasement. And such a disruption must also be accompanied by pain not physical, but mental and intellectual. The trouble that comes upon us is always just the one we feel to be the hardest that could possibly happen. It is always the one we feel we cannot possibly bear. If we look at it from a wider point of view, we shall see that we are trying to burst through our shell at its one vulnerable point, that our growth 
to be real growth must progress evenly throughout. Just as the body of a child grows, not first the head and then a hand, followed perhaps by a leg, but in all directions at once. Regularly and imperceptibly, we grow. She continues saying, humanity's tendency to cultivate each part separately, neglecting uh, the others in the meantime, every crushing pain is caused by the expansion of some neglected part, which expansion is rendered more difficult by the effects of the cultivation bestowed elsewhere. If we look back on our lives, isn't this true? Isn't the pain that has come upon us at these times the one that we think we just cannot possibly bear? It is the part of ourselves that we've pushed away or forgotten or tried to ignore. If we think of karma as a universal law that seeks to balance all in the universe and in doing so provides us with the opportunity for growth and expansion of consciousness, we might start to think about karma a little differently which, thinking about it differently, uh, may be a moment of expanding our consciousness as well. So, what does all of this have to do with forgiveness? There are so many components to this discussion, probably as many components as there are hurts in the world, which is countless. But let's touch on just a few. As theosophists, we have committed ourselves to recognizing the unity of all life. Not just recognizing it cognitively, but recognizing it in our hearts, completely to the depths of our inmost being. Recognition of this interconnectedness tells us that being angry with another person is the same thing as being angry at ourselves. And being angry with ourselves is the same as being angry with all of life. Putting the idea of forgiveness and the concept of unity together, we are strongly encouraged, if not compelled, to move forward. To move forward in the direction of forgiveness. And we move in this way, not for the benefit of self, although we are benefited. We forgive because it is best for humanity as a whole. Say that again. We forgive because it is best for humanity as a whole. Mabel Collins in her essay on karma says, quote, desire to sow no seed for your own harvesting. Desire only to sow that seed of fruit I'm sorry, to sow that seed, the fruit of which shall feed the world. Something else to consider when we look at the spiritual components of forgiveness are the thoughts and feelings experienced when we are hurt by another. Earlier, we discussed that when we don't forgive another person, we can hold on to those feelings associated with the hurt. Anger, resentment, bitterness, and on and on. These feelings and the accompanying thoughts surround us. We don't see them, but
but we know they exist, exist. They impact us. Those thoughts and feelings, ultimately, they surround us. They impact not just us, but the world around us. And ultimately, they expand outward into the entire mental field of consciousness. The Mahatma K.H. wrote in letter number 18, chronological, thoughts are things, have tenacity, coherence, and life. They are real entities. We find further elucidation of this concept in another of the Mahatma letters, when it is in, let's see, in another of the Mahatma letters, when it is written, every thought of an individual upon being evolved passes into the inner world and becomes an active entity by associating itself, coalescing, as we might term it, says the Mahatma, with an elemental. That is to say, with one of that is to say, with one of the semi-intelligent forces of the kingdoms. It survives as an active intelligence, a creature of the mind's begetting for a longer or shorter period, pro proportionate with the original intensity of the cere cerebral action which generated it. My apologies for tripping over the words. The Mahatma goes on, thus a good thought is perpetuated as an active beneficent power, an evil one as a maleficent demon. And so an individual is continually peopling his current in space with a world of his own, crowded with the offsprings of his fancies, desires, impulses, and passions. In other words, when we hold on to those feelings, anger and bitterness, and all, so on, we are peopling our world in an unseen way with them, with the thoughts, with feelings. And the stronger and more intentional the feelings, stronger and more intentional the thoughts, the stronger they are, and the longer they last. Can you imagine holding on to something like that? And what it must be like on the unseen worlds if someone holds on to something like that for 30 or 40 or 50 or more years? This impacts us, but not only us as individuals and those around us, but again, the entire mental plane of consciousness. The karmic implications are astounding. We are sending out these vibrations. We are attracting like vibrations and adding them to the consciousness of humanity. If we look at the assertions we discussed a few minutes ago, we know that these vibrations will rebound on us. On the other hand, forgiving, not excusing or accepting or allowing the hurt to be forgotten. But forgiving by recognizing that we are responsible for our own responses and letting go of the feelings that bind us to that hurt. By doing this, we will heal those hurts. Added to that, if we recognize that each of us is on our own evolutionary journey, just occurred to me, no, okay. If, my apologies. If we recognize that each of us is on our own evolutionary journey, then 
we also are recognizing that this is our way to learn and to grow. We may at that point then begin to be able to see the situation from a different perspective. We may even find that we feel empathy or compassion for the person who hurt us. Maybe, maybe not. Again, not excusing or forgetting or accepting the behavior. We may recognize that this person still needs to learn something that perhaps we've already learned, which is not to hurt others in this particular way. If and when we move in this direction, we are, quote, peopling our world, world, to use the words of the Mahatma, with vibrations of compassion, understanding, and unity. Additionally, seemingly, we are freeing ourselves and the other person from being tied together karmically. We have released that attachment, moving into the arena of harmony and equilibrium. As we have said, all of these vibrations will rebound on us. If we look at the assertion that karma is a law of the universe, impersonal and inexorable, we know that we, along with others, will be faced with the opportunity to grow. There's no need to hold on to feelings that are divisive. There's no need for us to seek revenge or retaliation or even to hold a grudge knowing that all of us will learn from our choices in a way that most effectively provides us with the opportunity for the greatest possible growth. It is important that we don't perceive karma as a means of revenge, which we hear people say, right? But it's most important that we realize that we are responsible for our own responses. As I hear myself talk about things, I wonder how I would react if I were experiencing some of the horrific things that are happening in our world today. How would I be responding if family members friends, people I love, were murdered, abducted, bombed, starved, and so on. Please know that I am not excusing or accepting behaviors that defy description. Humanities inhumanity must never be excused or accepted. But it can be forgiven. Please know too that I'm not suggesting we shouldn't experience the feelings that are associated with hurt, betrayal, we have emotions for a reason. We're in this physical body with an emotional body for reasons. They are part of our physical manifestation and paradoxically <laughs> help us on our spiritual journey. Feelings must be felt, all of them. But those feelings that are divisive, that do not move us toward harmony and equilibrium, unity. Those feelings we don't want to get stuck in. Experience them, work through them, 
and let them go. As beings in manifestation, we're called upon to work through these feelings, to control our thoughts, to understand thoughts and feelings, to manage them appropriately, and then to move forward. Don't I make it sound easy? It's not. I think that this is perhaps one of the most difficult tasks we face in the world of manifestation. It is a challenge on a daily basis for us to work through these tasks we have been given. Sometimes we'll be successful. And when we're not, certainly we will have another opportunity. Each of us will work through our feelings differently. And that work is, is so individual that there's not one way to actually do it beyond recognizing the feeling, experiencing the feeling, and working our way through it. It's a topic for another conversation, I think. But work through those feelings and those thoughts, we must. We must. This is part of forgiveness, and it's part of moving forward on the path toward conscious unity with all beings. I'm reminded of the, of the statement attributed to Jesus as he was being crucified. That quote, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The root cause of hurting others seems to be ignorance. They know not what they do. The ignorance of the unity of all beings. Ignorance that hurt caused to another hurts us all. So this is my grandson, Jordan, when he was a toddler. And I love this picture. Because he looks like he is so happily loving his toys, doesn't it? He's just cuddling them and, and looking at them like, oh, these are so wonderful. Actually, what he was doing, he was keeping them away from the other little kids. He didn't want anybody else to touch his toys. So he had gathered them up and held them to his chest so nobody else could get them. Isn't that what human beings do? These are my toys. You can't have them. Did we blame Jordan for grabbing toys away from the other kids? No. He's a toddler. Well, he's not now, but he was then. He didn't know. He hadn't yet learned the importance of sharing and playing together unity. So we teach toddlers these skills. We model them. We actually physically teach them. We all have to share. Nobody's going to get mad at that cute little guy. Can we do any less for those in the world who cause hurt? and suffering because they are ignorant. Again, not accepting, excusing, or forgetting humanity's inhumanity, but understanding the ignorance from which it stems. And forgiving the ignorance. As we come to a close, we have to ask ourselves, we know 
that forgiveness has repercussions in the spiritual world, as do all of our thoughts and feelings and actions. Karma plays an integral role when we decide to forgive another person. We are choosing how we will move forward when we are hurt, even from the most egregious hurts. We are choosing whether we we will respond intentionally with forgiveness or react from a personality-based perspective and hold on to feelings that are divisive. We are choosing to live our beliefs or not. Ultimately, will we choose to live according to our beliefs, to truly be theosophists in thought, word, and deed, as difficult as that is? Regardless of our choice, we are ultimately creating our own destiny. As seekers on the path, we must choose wisely, even when that requires so much of us. Thank you.